Okay, I've, I have started recording, um, just to be sure. Uh, 14 participants. All right, should we start? Should we start now? Uh, Damian, you think you want to wait a yeah, few that's more good minutes? Now. Yeah, no, yeah. that's fine. All right. Um, okay. So Welcome, you everyone. Six are here. Oh, I think so. I think so. All right. Um, <laughs> So welcome everyone to the first seminar of the UMass Boston Economics Department seminar series. Um, we have with us Dr. Tomas Rota from Goldsmiths College, University of London. Um, and he will be presenting his paper, Information Rents, Economic Growth and Income Inequality and Investigation of the United States. Um, so Tomas, um, go ahead, like you have 45 minutes. Um, and in the meantime, I, everyone, if you can um, keep yourself on mute, unless you have to ask a question. Um, so uh, the speaker has agreed to take any questions during the talk. Um, yeah, go ahead, um, Tomas. Rishabh, thank you very much for, the, for having me, John. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here to see some um, old friends <laughs> from uh, the PhD times. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm very, very glad to be here and to present uh, the results of one of my uh, recent papers. The topic of my presentation actually goes back to my PhD dissertation because I have been working on this topic for a while because I had to develop the methodology to, uh, to compute uh, Marxist categories and then measure uh, the size of unproductive accumulation in the US, including information rents. And now I'm doing the econometric work to try to figure out um, the causal effects between the variables. So uh, that's the current stage of my research. Um, let me share my screen with you. Now you can see my screen, right? Um, okay, good. Uh, so the title of the paper that I'm presenting today uh, is Information Rents, Economic Growth, and inequality, an empirical study of the United States. Um, by the way, uh, the slides that I'm using right now, they have already been uploaded to my website. You can see the address on the screen, thomasrota.wordpress.com. So the, yeah, the slides are there. So uh, feel free to access the blog and then um, download the PDF with the slides if you want. Um, so uh, I'm gonna start with the objectives of the paper. Of course, I come from a, uh, from a Marxist background. So the first thing that I wanna do, this is just a broad objective of the paper, um, is of course to rethink Marxist theory, right? And also to rethink value theory from uh, classical political economy. But why am I doing this? Um, one of the reasons that I'm trying to rethink Marxist theory is because of the fast expansion of the knowledge economy. And you can include in the knowledge economy what, it, what is called the intangible assets. So the huge expansion and growth of the uh, knowledge economy, information economy, cognitive capitalism, whatever you call it, or intangible assets, uh, that's what I'm uh, trying to theorize, measure, and then do econometrics about. Um, one of the things that we observe, um, especially in the past uh, five decades, is the widespread commodification of knowledge and information. So right now, knowledge and information are commodities, are commodities. And when I say a commodity, I mean a commodity in the Marxist sense of the term, which means um, it's something that is produced for profit. It's a product of labor that is produced for explicitly for, for profit. It, could, it can be a service or a product, but it doesn't have to be tangible. So it can be tangible, it can be intangible, it can be a good or a service. Uh, in this specific paper, what I'm trying to do is to uh, do an empirical study of the impact of information commodification on growth and distribution in the United States. So I'm gonna check the effect of knowledge and information commodification on growth and distribution. That's what I'm trying to do. So it's an empirical work. 
but, but, but there is a big theoretic, theoretical background to it. Um, the specific question of, this, of the paper is the following. How does the commodification of knowledge and information affect growth, labor productivity, and economic inequality? So that's the specific question that I'm gonna address in this paper using econometrics. Now, I'm gonna start now with the theoretical framework. Uh, the first thing that the paper does is to expand Marxist value theory to the domain of commodified knowledge and information, or what I like to call knowledge commodities. So anytime that I say knowledge commodity, I'm referring to commodified knowledge or information. And most of the time, I'm going to use knowledge and information as synonyms interchangeably, OK? Now, the first argument that I make, and I have been making this in other publications, is not, this is not specific to this publication, but it's the background, is that reproduction time, not the original production time, determines the value of a commodity. And this is the basic claim for my theoretical framework. If we go back to Marx, we're gonna see, uh, it's stated many times over that what determines the value of a commodity, it's not the original time um, spent to produce it. And when I say time, I mean direct and indirect labor time. Okay, just to be clear, it's current labor and past labor. But Marx emphasizes that it's reproduction time that determines the value of commodities. Reproduction time includes the direct and indirect labor time socially necessary to reproduce a commodity. The key word here is to reproduce a commodity. Now, if you commodify knowledge, if you commodify information, if they're produced for profit, you're gonna have zero value. And that's the issue with intangible assets because it takes a lot of time and it's very costly to originate them, to produce them for the first time. But once they are produced, they don't need labor time to be reproduced or they need very, very, very little labor time to be reproduced. So they have zero value. If they have zero value, they should be classified as an unproductive activity, right? Now, I'm gonna use the distinction that comes from political economy. It's not just Marx, all right? This is, um, it comes from Adam Smith, from, um, from David Ricardo too, and other uh, classical political economists, um, Malthus, they were all using this uh, distinction between uh, productive and unproductive activities. So the basic definition is, if you produce, if the activity produces new value added, it's classified as productive. If it doesn't produce new value added, it's classified as unproductive, okay? It's just a definition. Now, of course, unproductive activities can indirectly contribute to productive activities. But we need to be clear about the definition. The definition only concerns the direct origin of value added. Okay, the definition does not include indirect effects. My empirical measures and my econometric models are gonna measure the direct and indirect effects, but the definition of productive and unproductive relate only to, relates only to the uh, direct effects, okay? But of course, in the measures, we're gonna check, maybe the, that's what I find, the indirect effects are larger than the direct effects. Now, if this is true, then the incomes of unproductive activities are actually drawn, are value added that is drawn from productive activities, okay? So as Duncan Foley repeats uh, over and over, value needs to come from somewhere, okay? And this, this discussion about the origin of value, in, from my perspective, is something that only comes from uh, classical political economy because in the standard orthodox approach, this discussion about the origin of value kind of disappeared, okay? Uh, we have some publications in the mainstream that talk about um, DUP, directly in productive activities, but uh, no, processes, something like this. And, but what they mean by productive and unproductive is, is, is different. Um, they don't have an actual value theory to explain these things. Um, now, 
In the paper and in past publications, I make a claim that for me is kind of obvious, but Marxists and political economists, they, they seem to get very agitated <laughs> when I see these things, okay? The last sentence that is on the screen. So producing a commodity for profit is a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for the activity to be productive or value added. Okay, one more time. Producing a commodity for profit is a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for the activity to be productive of value added. Why? Because certain commodities are commodities and they don't have value. They have zero value. Okay, so the fact that something is produced for profit as a commodity is necessary, but is not a sufficient condition. One example is commodified knowledge. If you commodify knowledge, it's a commodity, it's produced for profit, but it's not a productive activity, which means the profits from the commodification of knowledge are rents that are derived from other activities that originate with value added. So knowledge and information require huge amounts of labor time to be produced, but virtually no labor time to be further reproduced once they are produced. Knowledge and information can be easily copied. So commodified information has zero value, has zero value added, and therefore has zero surplus value. It does not originate surplus value, which means that the profits derived from knowledge commodities are value added, reallocated from other activities. These other activities can be productive or, or, or unproductive, but ultimately the value added is gonna be originated in productive activities, okay? Because you can have one unproductive activity by knowledge commodities from other unproductive activities. So, but ultimately value added needs to come from productive activities. So then I use this terminology, which I have introduced uh, in my papers. I call them knowledge rents or information rents. I use them as synonyms. So if I say information rents or knowledge rents, um, for me, they mean the same. It's just the same, two, two different ways of saying the same thing. Um, just a short list of um, some examples you know, of knowledge commodities. So, drug formulas. Notice that I'm not saying the drug itself. I'm not saying the drug. I'm saying the drug formula. The formula is the knowledge commodity, not the drug itself, not the, not the, not the chemical powder. I mean the formula, the scientific thing, you know, behind before you produce the, the chemical powder. Um, other examples, software, data, computer code, books, journals, scientific publications, uh, movies, recorded concerts, recorded music, music scores, compositions, right? So as I just said, do not confuse the knowledge commodity, like the drug formula, with the material artifacts, the artifact like the chemical powder that stores the knowledge commodity. Because most of the time, the knowledge commodity is going to be stored somewhere that is that, that might be tangible. But when I say knowledge commodity, I'm talking about the intangible stuff, like the knowledge, like how you commodify that knowledge, like the formula to produce the drug. Because the material artifact that stores the knowledge commodity has value added. Okay. But the knowledge commodity does not have value added. Thomas, can I ask a, a question? Sure, of course. Thank you. Um, so I guess um, in, in the beginning, and even right now, the last line you said that the, the, the knowledge commodity does not have value added. You said that's by definition because we're not including indirect value. But no, we are. why? We are. In the knowledge well, commodity? We are, we are. Value is... The value is the labor time directly and indirectly necessary to reproduce a commodity. So it's current labor and past labor. So 
the the value of the inputs they are transferred to the um, but the thing is it either it's either zero or it tends to zero very quickly sorry i should have been more specific it, so it, it doesn't have value added but it it right knowledge commodity the knowledge commodity does not have value added but in part you no said that's because either. we don't include and no, and no value either Okay. No value either, or at least, or at least, as an as an empirical approximation, I could say the the value is it tends to zero very quickly, because mm -hmm. for example, let's suppose that we you know you, you want to store the chemical formula, so you need a PDF file, right? So you need computers to replicate the PDF file, but if you you can do that indefinitely, you mm -hmm. can basically in a few seconds you can have billions of copies of that PDF file. So I, I agree with you, like you could trace a little bit of value that is being transferred from the inputs, but it's, I'm, considering, I'm, I'm considering that to be empirically uh, negligible because you could make copies of movies uh, indefinitely without... Um, That's right, I agree. I think my question was more, very little, mm -hmm. why doesn't it have value, value added? If, for example, um, there is indirect means... value from a drug formula being that knowledge being used to to create the next drug formula, right? If you're if you're building on knowledge, if you're building on knowledge that mm -hmm. was already created, right? You, you you said it in the beginning where you said in your empirics there will be indirect value added from knowledge. But for whatever reason, that indirect value is not no, incorporated no, 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 in no, value no, added. No. Yeah. No, no, I mean it, the effect. No, no, I said effect. I was mentioning the okay. effect, not what I'm saying is, for example, a drug formula, even though directly it doesn't create new value added, if if we use the Marxist framework. Mm -hmm. Still, it can have a secondary, an indirect effect that is larger than the primary effect. I was okay. talking about the consequences. So, for example, a new invention, even though that invention, the, the knowledge part, doesn't, doesn't create new value added directly, it can increase labor productivity in other activities once it is used as an input into other activities. So one thing is the inputs that are used to produce the knowledge commodity, and another thing is when the knowledge commodity itself becomes an input into other activities. So those are two different things. So okay. And, and, and if course, that knowledge, the knowledge commodity, commodity, the knowledge commodity okay. itself can become an input into another, into the production of another knowledge commodity too. So okay. So my estimates do take into account um, um, uh, these effects. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to be clear with the definitions because I'm using a terminology that comes from classical political economy and from Marxist theory that, let's say, it's not part of the standard curriculum. So, for, for, for example, when I say unproductive, many people get angry because they're like, oh, you're saying that these people are unproductive. I'm like, no, no, it's just a definition. Like, I'm not saying it's bad or it's secondary. You know, it's just, um, it's just a definition. Um, Unfortunately, it has a moral component uh, that is not part of the theory, but people associate unproductive with uh, unnecessary. Um, I have a um, question and a comment. Mm -hmm. So my question sorry, is... She, there's Shripa, sorry, uh, Lucas has a question also first. Let, oh, okay, let's go, fine. No, okay, sorry, fine. then Lucas, then Shripa, yeah. then Harry. Thank you. Uh, firstly, like, I agree with your general proposition. I just have like one question, like, because the first labor that is used to produce the first, like the formula of the drug, to follow your example, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of research costs. And then you can add all this value in just one drug. Of course, like in the limit, you're going to be like, the knowledge gonna become a capital and gonna be like adding like path labor in the new in the new commodity, like in the new drug. 
that is added. Like the formula is still the same. In the limit, like is of course, like with the time, if the intellectual property is preserved, we're gonna have like zero value added, but it, I think it's not applied like for all knowledge commodities. I don't know if I make me understood. Look, let, let me try to put this in another way because it might, it might sound confusing. I'll try to say the same thing in another way. So if, if the Marxist theory of value is correct, then what I'm saying is consistent. If the axioms, because I, I still think that the labor theory of value for Marx, it's, it's axiomatic. So there are certain axioms. So if those axioms are correct, then what I'm saying is completely consistent with the axioms. Another discussion that we could have, but it would be much more complicated, is if the axioms of the labor theory of value are still correct. I believe it is. I believe it is. Um, it's very simple. One of the axioms of the labor theory of value is the original source of value added is direct labor. That's one of the axioms of the labor theory of value. The origin of value added is direct labor, or what Marx called living labor. Right. So if you don't have present labor. Just, just, just one second. If you don't have living labor, you're not gonna have value added. So for example, I have a different, I'm working on a different uh, paper about Bitcoin, and I'm trying to answer the question if Bitcoin has value added. So in that case, I claim that Bitcoin has value, but no value added because it doesn't have living labor. The computers do all the work, but it, it has value because it is transferring value from the computers, but you don't have living labor. So directly, Bitcoin does not increase GDP. Because I was thinking about this question, did, does, does Bitcoin increase GDP? And the answer that I found is no, directly, okay? Bitcoin does not directly increase GDP, because it's just transferring the value from the inputs, the basically the computers uh, into Bitcoin, but there is no living labor because the computers are doing all the work. So Bitcoin has value, but it doesn't have value added. Knowledge commodities, they don't have value added and they tend to have zero value too, because if you push it to the limit, uh, they don't have value at all. So in the digital world, the labor theory of value, that's my claim, the labor theory of value still applies. But we need to make clear that there is a huge gap between production time and reproduction time. The Marxist theory of value claims that values are determined by reproduction time, not the original production time. Which means if the axioms of Marx's value theory are correct, then what I'm saying is completely consistent. If you wanna discuss the axioms of the theory, it's a different discussion, we can have that discussion, but it's, it's, it's a different discussion. I think is I speak okay? wrongly, because I definitely agree with you that in the limit is, zero value added, but it's like capital. Like if I produce a regular commodity, not like a knowledge commodity, I will use capital that is past labor in Ricardo theory and Marx theory. And I will add this past labor to the new, the new commodity that I produced. And like, it's gonna be through the depreciation of capital and knowledge in the limit has a depreciation as well. But as in the capital, sometimes like a firm, a company depreciate the capital like in 10 years, but use the machine for 20 years. It's about that that I was like talking like, cause we have the production time that is high and use a lot of labor. So like capital, it's going depreciating and adding value in the limit when it's larger reproduced as windows, there is zero, zero. No, no, because I, I, I understand your argument. Now, what is, let's suppose that in order to build a machine, you have to use calculus. 
What is the depreciation of calculus when you build a machine using calculus? No, I don't calculus know. Calculus does I not depreciate. Okay. No, that, that's what I'm saying. Calculus does not depreciate. The laws of physic, physics do not depreciate. If you want to build a quantum computer, you need to know the theory of quantum mechanics. But the theory of quantum mechanics does not depreciate. Yeah, but it's not so. Yeah. Let, let, so let, let me move on. Then we, but I got let it. Let me move on. It. Then we. Yeah, should we uh, quickly do the, like, uh, let's quickly do the question, then let's continue with the rest of the presentation. Uh, yeah. Shripad and Harry had a question. Yeah, I had a very quick question, which is, uh, I was not sure why you are um, not at all referring to abstract labor. Is there a reason? Um, because... oh, no, it's implicit. It, no, it's abstract. It's implicit. Okay, it's yeah. implicit. Okay. And yeah, I, my implicit. comment was yeah. actually very simple, which is uh, a lot of what you are saying is actually something that uh, is there in, for example, endogenous growth models like Romer's model. In fact, the example that you gave, you know, like suppose somebody has come up with the proof of Fermat's last theorem. To come up with Fermat's last theorem, the proof takes enormous amount of time, but to reproduce the proof is trivial. So this mm -hmm. idea is very much there and maybe you can I mean, I'm just saying that if you want the idea to be appealing to a wider audience, you can cite endogenous growth models, which are making a similar point. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, I'm, I'm, let's say, I'm framing this discussion in terms of classical value theory, because this discussion about where value comes from kind of disappeared from the literature after classical political economy. That's the reason. So I, I agree with your uh, comments. I'm just saying this discussion about what is productive, what is unproductive, what, where is the origin of value, it kind of disappeared. Like, and if you go to Keynesian um, theories or Kaletskian theories, this discussion about value kind of, kind of disappeared. Like it's, and I still think Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, but I still think it's 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 uh, it's valuable to 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 know where value comes from because you know if the activities that don't produce value if they are consuming more than what they are contributing. So um, so even if we go to these theories of endogenous growth, and I completely agree with, with you, we still don't have a definition of what is productive or 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 unproductive. So even though we are measuring the consequences. Um, Harry? Yeah, so look, one of the things that I have... Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas, sorry. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Actually, um, uh, maybe not quick question, but um, a clarifying question. Uh, it seems to me that uh, in some ways, what you're doing is similar to what uh, Adorno and Benjamin do with like the work of art and mechanical reproduction, right? So it seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong about this, and that's why I would like to pose this as a question. It's like, you're saying that there are two different items. There's the prototype and there's the copy. And it seems to me that you're interested in the copy here because uh, capitalism is not about, you know, like a commodity that is produced once. You're interested in like the mass production mm -hmm. of an item, yeah. right? And so whatever yes. yeah. work and whatever uh, knowledge and effort and blood, sweat and tears goes into producing the original item is irrelevant because you are interested in how to produce and reproduce something many, many times, right? So um, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that, uh, maybe I'm wrong about this, but like it, that's, that's how uh, you know, I would read this, uh, right? That it's, it's the reproduction that matters to you and therefore uh, the, the ownership conditions of knowledge should not affect the value uh, conditions from a Marxian sense that would be derived, uh, right? Like that knowledge could be free, that knowledge could be monopolized. And in your case, you basically say that this is, this is monopolized, therefore there's a, a knowledge rent, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Even though I would not use the word uh, irrelevant. I'm not saying that the war, the, the labor to produce the prototype is irrelevant. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's unproductive. 
Okay, so le, le, uh, okay, all right. Uh, let me ask a second question now. Um, uh, in some ways, uh, I wonder uh, along the lines of like hard and negri, uh, because you are basically. Wait, wait, Harry, let 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 me say something before I forget, because you mentioned the Frankfurt School. One of one of the inspirations for me to carry out all the econometrics, because I haven't reached the, the econometrics yeah, we'll uh, uh, part, but. One of the inspirations was actually a quote from Frederick Jameson. You know that book by Lyotard, The Condition of Postmodernity from 1978, I guess, from Lyotard. So I think Jameson wrote the, the preface, the, the foreword to that book. And there is a paragraph in which Frederick Jameson ex explicitly says, the Frankfurt School had a great contribution to uh, to Marxism and to you know political economy and to, you know, but they didn't have a value theory of intangible assets and knowledge. And when I saw that quote from James, I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to do that. <laughs> you know, like that's what I'm gonna work on because, um, you know, maybe somebody maybe somebody should do it. So uh, what I'm trying to do is this is. Uh, kind of build on what has been done before and, and build the value theory of, because the Frankfurt School didn't have a value theory for cultural production for, uh, um, for all, the, all these intangible assets. So, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm, so that quote uh, was, was one of the original inspirations to do this type of empirical work, theoretical so, so, work too. So let me ask you also the question about like uh, Harden Negri and the Opera Ismo School. Uh, in some ways, I think that if you, you know, aside from the examples that you gave here about knowledge production, like another example of knowledge production uh, would be, you know, the commodities that are produced when we go on a website and, you know, like there are cookies on that website and we basically like, you know, provide a lot of information to, you know, to companies and we don't know what happens, right? So it's this idea of like the consumer as, you know, as producer of knowledge that is then later commodified and basically used for profit. So um, I wonder if that's something you consider here because uh, that kind of deviates from your example and from your definition of like, uh, you know, commodity production for profit, right? Because if I go on a website and if I like provide information to like web developers with the like cookies that like are stored on this website, I'm not doing something intentionally, right? I'm not like providing this information uh, you know, I'm, I'm not working uh, in the same way that like someone works when they create a drug formula, but the yeah. result is still, you know, uh, profit making out of this activity, right? Which for hard and negative kind of like basically means that like this productive and productive distinction is, is irrelevant. But um, mm -hmm. I wonder if that is captured in your in your theory. No, it is. It is. No, I have I have been thinking about this. Uh, I think the answer is simple in this case because the consumers or you know, our behavior on social media is producing information, but that information is still not commodified. I mean, the fact that you are generating data from your behavior online, uh, it still needs to be processed by the companies in order to be commodified. So Google has machine learning and deep learning algorithms and people working on it to commodify the information that comes from you. I mean, the raw information is not, is not yet a commodity. Your behavior, like the raw data that comes from your behavior online, is still not uh, the un the unprocessed data. Is still not a commodity. That data needs to be processed and worked on to become a commodity, and then it can be used for you know as an input for advertisers and and so forth. So it's not enough for us to generate content online. You you need to process all that content to commodify it, and then it becomes a source of profit. So I think, I think let's, go, do... let's go to the end, like all the way till the end and take the rest of the questions and discussion to that point, um, right? But, but Rishab, you're told we have four hours, no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I may have. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on. Um, all right. So one of the, you can still see my screen, right? My, my screen share. Okay, so one of the things that I have been saying is the following, do not say, productive sectors or productive industries or even productive labor. 
because actually we can only talk about activities. You can say that an activity, a specific activity is either productive or unproductive, but you cannot say things about sectors or industries or even labor. It's not, people say unproductive labor, but actually it's not very correct to say productive or unproductive labor. Because it, it's, the reason is very simple, it's because the same company uh, can perform a mix of productive and unproductive activities, okay? And the same applies to workers, okay? The same worker can perform a mix of productive and unproductive activities. So when I teach, I am productive. When I do research and I publish a paper that's unproductive, using the Marxist definition of um, productive and so I am productive and unproductive at the same time. If I publish a paper, my paper can be copied indefinitely. You know, so it's unproductive. But when I teach, when I'm doing you know live teaching, it's productive. So. Strictly, strictly speaking, it's not correct to say productive or unproductive labor. We, we, need, to talk, we need to talk about activities. Um, only in a very few cases, a company or worker is completely productive or unproductive, okay? Of course, when we work with data, we need to make some approximations, okay? Of course, the data is not gonna match theory completely. We need to make some approximations, especially at the aggregate level. This this is why I use what is called the redefined or modified input output matrices from the BEA, okay? Because the BEA has the, let's say, original uh, input output matrices, but then it creates a redefined or modified matrix that shifts the secondary sources of income into the primary sectors. So for example, if a hotel has hotel rooms and a restaurant inside the hotel, the modified input output matrix takes the restaurant out of the lodging industry and puts it in the restaurant business, in the restaurant role. Right, so if a company like General Motors have a bank, a captive bank to finance uh, the production of cars and the, the, the purchase of cars and the insurance, the modified input of the matrix is gonna take the bank that is captive, you know, it's, it belongs to General Motors, but it's gonna move the bank to the banking industry, to the, to the finance role and keep the production of cars in the, um, in the auto uh, production. So it gives a much better approximation and measurement of uh, productive and unproductive activities, this uh, reclassification of primary and secondary sources of income. Um, as I mentioned before, the classification between productive and unproductive refers only to the direct effects, okay? So productive activities directly produce new value added. Unproductive activities uh, or activity does not directly produce new value added. But the indirect effects might be larger than the direct effects, okay? So we need to keep clear, you know, what is the definition? The definition is about the direct, the origin of value added, but of course, um, we also have indirect effects. So as I mentioned before, you can produce something that doesn't have value added, but once it is used as an input into another activity, this other activity is gonna increase labor productivity. And we see this all the time, right? So unproductive activities might indirectly increase labor productivity or even boost uh, demand in productive activities. So unproductive activities can either crowd out or crowd in productive activities. So we can have a, and then we need to see what is the net, uh, the net, the, the net effect, um, because we're gonna have crowd out and crowd in at the same time, and we need to measure the, the, the net effect. Um, so these activities can be either complementary or substitutes, um, and the estimates are gonna show, of course, the net effect. Oh, and another thing too, which complicates uh, uh, the analysis, we have short run and we have long run effects. So it's possible to have a 
crowd in effect in the short run and then a crowd out crowding out effect in the long run or even the opposite the crowd crowding crowding out effect in the, in the short run and then a crowding in effect in the long run Now, a few words about the empirical approach. So I'm using uh, data from the United States from 1947 to 2011. Um, I'm gonna transform the, the raw data that comes from the modified input-output matrices, the NIPE accounts and the BLS series uh, into Marxist categories. I have done this in previous papers. It took me a long time. I was mentioning the, I was mentioning this to uh, Rishab before we began the session. Um, and one of the original things that I'm that I have been trying to do is to actually measure the size of the knowledge rents in the United States from 1947 to 2011. So if you look at the political economy literature, you're going to see many contributions. Um, one of the best contributions. Yeah, is from uh, Anwar Sheikh and, and, and Tonak from 1994. Uh, so I made uh, some slight modifications to their approach. I updated uh, the data um, and then I included knowledge rents as part of the unproductive uh, incomes. So, and that makes a, that makes a big difference in the, in the measurements. Um, I'm gonna compute uh, many measures of productive and unproductive activities in terms of flows of income and stocks of, of uh, fixed assets. Um, the flow measures um, in this paper, because now I, I have to focus on, on the results of this paper. Um, so the flow measures, they're measuring the flows of income and I have net and gross, net and gross of inputs, of intermediate inputs. Um, and I also have stock measures. They measure the, the, the stocks of fixed assets, net of depreciation. Why am I including the stocks here together with the flows? Because uh, if you look at the methodology, methodological notes from the BEA, the way that the BEA measures the stock of fixed assets, the stock of capital is by doing this. It's a cumulative, they, they, they make a sum of the investment expenditures in fixed assets, then they deduct a nonlinear depreciation rate. So that's how the BA computes the stock of uh, fixed capital in the United States. They, it's a sum of past, uh, it's the cumulative sum of past investment expenditures, and then they use a nonlinear depreciation to, to come up with the net measure of uh, the capital stock. So when I, when I include the stocks of capital in, in, in the regressions, I'm basically capturing the effects of the cumulative investments, uh, investment expenditures. So these are the variables that I'm gonna use, that I, that I use in the paper. So let's see if I can do this quickly. Uh, the first one is the total value. Oh, by the way, notice that I have divided uh, the table into the the first uh, tier here is the is for productive activities, the second tier for uh, unproductive activities, and then the whole economy down there. So the total value is the actually the total value produced um, in productive activities, uh, real values in two thousand and five dollars. The total value is gross of inputs. Okay. Uh, so it's gross of depreciation and it's gross of intermediate inputs. If I deduct the intermediate inputs and I deduct depreciation, I get the, uh, the value added, which is the net value or value added. This is not the same as GDP. Ideally, from a, from a classical political economy perspective, GDP should measure value added, okay? But as Omar Sheikh has, you know, has said this many times ago, actually our current measures of GDP, they inflate what a political economist would classify as value added because they double count the source of value added and then the use of value added. 
So my measure, my aggregate measure of value added is lower than GDP because I am deducting the incomes of unproductive activities. If you deduct uh, the salaries of the compensation of productive employees, you get the measure of surplus value. And the rate of exploitation is uh, the surplus value divided by the compensation of productive workers. KPA is the real stock of non-residential fixed assets in productive activities at replacement costs. Uh, it's net of depreciation in real terms. And I do the same for unproductive activities. So uh, for productive activities, we had total value. For unproductive activities, we have the gross income. So it's the same. It's the gross income. It includes intermediate inputs and depreciation if we deduct intermediate inputs and depreciation, we get the net income and so forth. Now, here, what I do specifically is I measure the share of, of information rents in the net income of unproductive activities, okay? And then I also include the share of finance and information rents together uh, to see you know, if it makes a difference to include or to exclude finance from the measurements. And then I have other me derived measures, which is just uh, the net income of unproductive activities relative to the value added produced in productive activities and so forth. Uh, and I do the same for the capital stock. So I measure the capital stock in activities that primarily derive their incomes from information rents, the capital stock in activities that primarily derive their incomes from finance, and also the relative measures of the fixed assets productive over, uh, unproductive over productive. Um, as measures of inequality, I'm using the income shares of the top 1% and the top 0.1%. And I'm also using uh, the label productivity measure from the BLS, okay? So these three last measure, measures here, the, the first two I take from Piketty, the uh, label productivity I take from the BLS, but all the others I have computed them myself uh, in previous papers, and I'm, in this paper, I use them to do the to do the econometric work. Uh, now, very quickly, uh, if you measure the cumulative growth rates um, from 1947 to 2011, of all those measures, you're going to observe two things. First, the unproductive measures rise much faster than the productive measures most of the time. And second, they rise faster after 1980. So 1980 in the United States seems to be a clear case of, of a regime change. Okay, the, the institutional regime changed, the technology changed, uh, and the unproductive, uh, unproductive activities started to rise uh, much faster than before 1980. So, if you look at the data, you can see that clearly. Um, another thing that you see is that the measures of inequality uh, are, are also rising uh, much faster after 1980, okay? Um, by the way, just to, I didn't include this in the slides, but just to be clear about this, because in the Keynesian and Kalatskian literatures today, especially when people are doing like econometric work, it seems that they want to oppose institutional change and technological change. And they say, oh, you know, the neoclassical economists, they emphasize technology to explain inequality and Keynesians are gonna explain the rising inequality using institutional factors. From a Marxist perspective, that distinction doesn't make any sense, okay? To oppose institutions and technology, okay? From a Marxist perspective, um, it's both, okay? You have inst institutional change driven by technology and you have technology and, and institutions um, both at the same time determining um, the path of inequality. Um, so three measures here in the first graph. The first, the dotted line is the net income, the aggregate net income of unproductive activities divided by surplus value from productive activities. The dashed line is the net income of unproductive activities divided by value added. 
And uh, the bold line, the black line, is the gross income of unproductive activities divided by the total value originated in productive activities. It looks like a secular rise from 1947 to 2011. Okay, there, there is some cyclical component here, but the, the trend is, is upwards, okay? And so far, I don't see any evidence of, of um, you know, mean reversion or something like that. It seems like a secular rise. And I believe, I might be wrong, I believe it's, it's the result of both technology and institutions. It's not either technology or institutions, it's both. Um, if you break down the net income of unproductive activities, uh, those are the five categories that I created. So first we have the government services, then finance and insurance, then uh, nonprofit uh, organizations and so forth, real estate, and then at the bottom, knowledge and uh, or information commodities at the bottom. So the, the last chunk here is the share of unproductive income that uh, can be classified as information rents from 1947 to 2011. Still, the biggest part here belongs to the government, even though it has shrunk a little bit. Um, and if you add finance and, and information rents, it's roughly now 44% of the total unproductive income, around 44, 45% in 2011. Now the capital stock. So the bold line is the unproductive capital stock divided by the productive capital stock. And the dashed line does the same, but excludes the government assets from, um, from the measurement of the unproductive capital stock. Uh, and you can, in both measures, you can see the fast rise. They're in different uh, axes. So the bold line is on the left axis and the dashed line is on the right axis. But you can see the secular rise after uh, 1982. So 1980 does seem to be a, um, a point of regime change here in the United States. Now the breakdown of the unproductive capital stock, I'm just drinking water here. Um, most of the unproductive capital stock belongs to the government, even though the share has been shrinking. Um, and then the knowledge and information activities are, are here, is the second to last chunk here. Uh, yeah, so that's the breakdown in terms of the fixed assets. Now, if you try to compute a kind of rate of return, which means the net income divided by the capital stock, that's what you get, the dotted line for productive activities, the bold line for unproductive activities. Um, the purpose is just to say, you know, how much of, how much one dollar of the capital stock gives you back in terms of uh, net income, okay? And of course, and of course, the net income in productive activities is, is classified as value added. Uh, and this is the last uh, graph that I have uh, for the descriptive part. Here, uh, I made everything into, a, um, into an index. Uh, 1980 is uh, um, 100. Um, so the dashed line here is the income share of the 0.1%. The, um, the dotted line here, the gray dotted line, is the share of the top 1%. Uh, finance information rents as a share of the net income of unproductive activities are the, the gray bold line here. Um, finance information rents as shares of the as shares of the unproductive capital stock is the bold um, black line. And finally, this line here, I don't know how to say that in English, <laughs> with the, it's a kind of stripe. Uh, it's the rate of exploitation of productive workers. So, uh, most of them, they have a steep rise after 1980. So the purpose of this graph is to show that uh, there is some kind of regime change in 1980. And then after 1980, uh, exploitation rises faster 
um, the share of finance and knowledge rents, uh, they rise faster and also inequality as measured by the uh, income shares of the top uh, 0.1% and 1%. Now, uh, what are the contributions of the paper to the... Perry, you have your hand raised? Yeah, I keep pressing it up and taking it on. Um, I have a question here. If you want to go one step back um, quickly, uh, how do you operationalize information rents here? Like, I mean, how do you... Uh, get a definition of like uh, information rents out of the, the NIPA or the BLS. And uh, related to this, it seems to be tracking the incomes of the 1%, right? Like, is there something about like, you know, the composition of uh, information rents that would correspond to uh, certain activities um, perhaps performed by I mean, 1%? I mean, okay. I mean, we know that the salaries and bonuses, both in finance and in information intensive industries are much higher than the average. So it's not just finance. I mean, if you, if you look at Silicon Valley, for example, the salaries are, are comparable to finance, salaries and bonuses, um, Amazon workers. I mean, I, I mean the, not, not the warehouse workers, but you know, people working with machine learning at Amazon, they make, they make around 300K. Years, so, but so. If, if we're thinking about like what activities are included as information, as knowledge activities, right? Like, are we talking about teachers? Are we talking about like Silicon Valley executives? Like, because if finance is excluded from this, right? Uh, yeah. Can you can you help us like think about you know how to operationalize this in the okay, data? No. Okay. Yes, yes. Give me because I need to open the appendix of the paper. Then I give you the exact list of. But it's it comes from it comes from the. Basically, it's everything that is here in that list that I gave you. Where is it? Here. All the activities that produce this, remember this slide? Because I can see these activities in the input-output matrices. You know, the BA has two types of matrices. It has the annual input-output matrices. It has 72 industries. I don't use those. I use the benchmark input output matrices. They have, they have more than 400 uh, industries, more than 400 rows. It's 400 by 400. So I think it's like 406 rows and columns. So you can see very specific activities. So anything that resembles, um, you know, the pharma industry, the software industry, data processing, all these words they appear in the in the output, uh, input output matrices. You can see those things clearly. So, um, because it's very, the benchmark matrices are very, very specific in terms of uh, the output of those uh, rows and columns. So um, it's possible to see all of that. And because I use the modified or redefined tables, then the, if, any of those is a secondary source of income, it's moved automatically to the primary sector. So the approximation is much better. I, I can show you the full list because it's a very long list, but it's in the it's in the it's in the it's it's in the appendix of the paper, like the exact classification of each industry. I can show you later, but I didn't put it in the slides because it's too long. Um, so is that okay? Should I can I move on? So what are the contributions of the paper to the existing literature? Um, so most of the empirical literature focuses on the effects of finance and financial assets on growth and inequality. And what I'm trying to do is to say, okay, that's true, but the commodification of knowledge has similar effects. So in the literature, uh, especially the heterodox literature, the usual division in the, when we work with data uh, is between financial and non-financial corporations. And what I'm trying to say is, okay, we can keep that uh, separation, but we should also consider the separation between productive and unproductive activities. Um, most of the literature has so far used uh, panel data sets that begin uh, in 1980 or after. You know, for developing countries, uh, 
we, we don't have much data, but at least for developed countries, uh, most of the data sets, most of them, not all, they begin in 1980. Um, and I claim that one of the things that happened because of this is that we miss, the data is gonna miss the transition from the pre-1980 phase to the post-1980 phase. So you miss this, um, if you use a panel data set that begins in 1980, you miss the transition from the regulated phase of capitalism to the uh, neoliberal phase of capitalism. And most of the panel data sets, uh, they are at the firm level and they focus either on listed companies, most, most of the time in the US, um, uh, even though some papers are, um, um, are uh, about companies in the UK or Europe, but they focus on listed companies because listed companies, you know, they make their data available. It's much more difficult to get data for unlisted company, non-listed companies. Um, and some, some empirical studies have been done uh, using census data from the US, but the census data is very unusual because it gives a lot of attention to manufacturing. So manufacturing has a lot of details, but sectors outside of manufacturing, uh, the data is not so much detailed. So uh, if you look at papers, for example, the last one by David Alter, uh, it's an excellent paper. Uh, it focuses very much on manufacturing because it uses census data, census data and um, the data is much more detailed uh, for manufacturing. Um, so my estimates, they do control for uh, financial incomes and financial activities and, and financial uh, fixed assets and financial activities. But the focus of the paper is, uh, is on the effects of um, activities that um, receive knowledge rents. So I do control for finance, but the focus of the paper is uh, knowledge rents. I'm using time series, annual time series from 1947 to 2011. So the data at least uh, capture the transition from uh, the pre-1980 to the post-1980 phase. Uh, I'm using input output data at the industry level, then I aggregate them using a similar technique to uh, Shake and Tonak, even though um, in the paper I explain the differences. Um, uh, yeah, so I use the data comes, it's at the industry level because we are I'm using um, uh, input output matrices and then I aggregate them using the Marxist classification between productive and unproductive. So the paper develops a consistent approach to the Marxist uh, theory of value, what I believe to be a consistent approach, but I think it is, uh, in the sense that reproduction time determines uh, values. If zero labor time is required for reproduction, then the commodity has zero value, zero value added, zero surplus value, it's an unproductive activity. Um, the profits in unproductive activities are value added, reallocated from uh, ultimately productive activities. So the, the labor in, in the production of commodified knowledge is not irrelevant, it's just unproductive. It's just unproductive. It's not. It's not relevant, or it doesn't matter in any way. It's just. It's just uh, unproductive of value. Now the results. Um, now I'm going to move to the econometric part. Uh, I'm using the ARDL model, and um, by the way, here I think I need some help with uh, from people that know more econom econometrics than me because I am. I am trying to measure causality to capture causality. All right. So the biggest problem that I have at the moment is to is about endogeneity. I think that's the most difficult problem that I'm facing right now. It's, it's endogeneity because uh, we can talk more about this later, but um, yeah, I need, I, need, I need to think better about this issue of endogeneity using a dynamic model with time series, uh, some kind of GMM with time series. I'm using the ARDL model and I'm using lagged values, but I might need to shift to some sort of GMM four times series um, to better capture causality. But I'm going to show you the results that I, that I have right now. So it's a single equation model 
um, in, in so it's an ARDL model in auto auto regress it's an auto regressive distributed leg model in error correction form. On the left hand side, we have the dependent variable uh, in first difference. Then we have the intercept. We have the dependent variable in levels here, lagged. Then we have uh, the other variables in levels here uh, with the beta coefficients. And then I have lags. I have lags of the endogen of the dependent variable. And I have uh, lags of the differences of the, the other variables too. So that's the basic uh, specification of the ARDL model for, for time series. Um, I'm, and, and then I use the, the PSS bounce test to determine the statistical significance of the variables that appear in levels. The PSS, if, if you have not seen the PSS test before, it's a test that measures the, the significance of the, of, the, of the betas, the coefficients that, um, that carry, the, carry the information from the variables in levels, okay? The, the variables in differences that capture the short run facts, they do not affect the limiting distribution of the PSS bounds test. Um, then I'm gonna use impulse response functions to simulate the, the results in the United States. And um, I use impulse response functions, and I'm also going to measure the economic effects, not just the statistical significance, because the impulse response functions, they show the combination of short run effects. And by the way, the short run effects are temporary effects. They come from the lag differences. The, the second brackets here. And also in the first brackets, we have the permanent long run effects, the, the variables in levels that are um, lagged. So all the variables are in logs, uh, lagged. Um, I check for statistical significance, but then I also compute the long run elasticities. Um, I compute the cumulative change over the uh, 65 years from 47 to 2011. And then I compute the economic effects as suggested by Deidre McCloskey. Uh, it's just the multiplication of the long run elasticities by the cumulative change. Uh, just to be clear, uh, I'm using the ARDL model. So the elasticities and the variables are in logs. So the elasticity is the coefficient of that variable divided by the negative of the coefficient of the lagged dependent variable. That's the way that it computes the, the, the elasticities in, in an ARDL model, because it's a dynamic model and the, the dependent variable uh, is lagged on the right-hand side. Um, when I plot, I'm gonna show you the plots. When I plot the impulse response functions, I, I need to give a shock to each regressor. The, so the shock, the, the impulse to each regressor is the cumulative change in that regressor from 1947 to 2011, okay? Because most of the, if you use VARs like vector auto regressions, most of the time the impulses are either uh, a, one, a one unit uh, change or a one standard uh, deviation change, but I decided to use the cumulative change from 1947 to 2011 as the impulse. Uh, so then the response converges to the long run economic effect. Okay. Um, now, I don't know what is the quality of the <laughs> image that you have in your screen. Um, so uh, these are the results of the, um, not even I can see the, the full screen because the zoom, sorry, Zoom's control panel is on top of my screen. Um, so the first two models, all the models use the same specification, but the first two, the endogenous, the dependent variable is value added in real terms. Then the next two use labor productivity as the dependent variable. And the last four, they use the uh, top 0.1% and then the top 1% uh, income shares. So in the first two models, I'm measuring the impact of 
unproductive activities and information rents and finance on value added, then the impact on labor productivity, then the impact on the top 0.1%, and then the impact on the top uh, 1%. So uh, then you have the statistical significance stars indicated um, as usual. Um, so a few results here. All the results are better summarized in the um, impulse response functions, but just some things that I should note here. Um, so if you look at the share of finance and, in, and share of finance and information rents in unproductive activities, you can see that the impact, the, the defects here are negative and significant. So they reduce value added growth. But when you take into account the effect from the expenditures uh, with investment, the effect is positive. I'm going to say the same thing in, um, using different words. So if you consider unproductive activities and how they spend the expenditures and investment in fixed assets, the contribution is actually positive to value added. But of course, they're living off, they're drawing value from productive activities, and this value that they're drawing has a negative impact on value-added growth. So you have both effects at the same time. You see, there is a positive effect that comes from investment expenditures, and then you have a negative effect that comes from the fact that these activities are drawing value from productive activities. So it's both at the same time positive effect from the capital stock, negative effect from the flow variables. And you can see that the share of finance and the share of information rents, they also have, um, they, they increase in quality. So the effect is positive on the income shares of the top 0.1% and top uh, 1%. Um, so they increase in quality, at least uh, by drawing income, they decrease uh, value added growth, and they have a positive contribution to labor productivity here in the short run. Now, I'm going to run the same models, but instead of holding, uh, instead of controlling for the share of finance and information rents, I'm going to control only for information rents. And that's what we get. So now instead of having the share of finance and information rents, we only, we only have the share of information rents. So excluded finance now. So the contribution is negative. It's not statistically significant, but the economic effect is larger. So here it's negative. But what is interesting is that the, if you consider all the unproductive activities together, they have a positive contribution to value added growth. But if you only consider the share of information rents, the contribution is negative. So even though we talk about productive and unproductive activities, actually in the aggregate, unproductive activities, they have a positive effect on productive activities. But when you look at finance and information rents specifically, they have a negative contribution. So, so, so that's why the breakdown is necessary within unproductive activities. And when you look at the impact on inequality, we get the same result. The overall impact of unproductive activities on inequality is actually to reduce inequality. But the specific impact of information rents and finance is to increase inequality. I'm going to show you the same result in another way. Okay, So these are the coefficients from the ARDL uh, uh, specifications. Now, I'm following uh, McCloskey um, and Ziliak here to compute the economic effects. So these are the same models again, but now I'm computing the cumulative change, the long run elasticity, and the economic effect. So now we can directly compare the sizes of each regressor directly, one against the other. So So again, here, the share of finance information rents has a negative economic effect 
on value added growth, and it has a positive effect in the sense it increases inequality. But the effect of the capital stock, cumulative expenditures in, in fixed assets is positive. So positive stock effect, negative flow effect, increases inequality. And here, excluding finance, we also see the negative here, minus um, 0 0.69, the negative contribution of information rights to value added growth, uh, 0.44, it means 44, it increased, 0.44 means 44% growth, the contribution to, let me, let me say that again. <laughs> so uh, the cumulative impact of information rents in the US from 1947 to uh, 2011 was to increase the top 0.1% uh, income share by 44%. That's what 0.44 means, okay? Um, and the, the same share of information rents and non-productive activities was responsible to increase the share of the top 1% uh, income share by 24% uh, cumulatively from 1947 to 2011. Um, and I was going to point out that, um, let me show you the impulse response function. So we can see the short run effects and long run effects together. Basically this, the impulse response functions are just gonna summarize the, all the previous results, but now visually. So, um, so the impulse response function itself is the dashed line in the middle, and the colors indicate the bootstrapped 75%, uh, 90%, and 95% uh, intervals. Um, um, so this is the impact on, on value added. So you can see that the impact from the share of finance information rents is negative. Um, the contribution of labor productivity as expected is positive. The rate of exploitation has a short run impact, but no long, long run effect. And uh, most of the impact comes from the, the share of finance information rents in the capital stock, which means the expenditures with fixed assets. Um, and you can see that the stock effect from investment has been larger than the so you see the indirect effect is larger than the direct effect. So even though uh, these activities are drawing value, they are, because of they, they spend money with investments, they also have a, they boost aggregate demand in productive activities. So in this case, I did find uh, the result that the indirect effect is larger uh, than the direct draw of value. Um, Here, you see, now you can see visually what I meant by, you see, if you look at panel E, the, in, the, the aggregate impact of unproductive activities is positive on value added. But when you consider the share of information rents, the impact is negative. So it's the case that it's actually information rents and finance that are being the drag not all unproductive activities, because you also have other, let's say, state-sponsored activities that have a positive contribution uh, in the sense of it increases value-added growth uh, and it reduces inequality. But it seems to be, the, the result is this, it seems to be that it's actually finance and information rents that are being a drag on value-added and increasing inequality, not the totality of um, unproductive activities. Um, this is the impact on, on labor productivity. And here you can see that the contribution is positive. So both finance and information rents have a positive contribution to labor productivity. So as I said before, they do contribute to increase labor productivity. Um, I see Plus, some people raising their hands. Yeah. yeah. Mike, I think Mike has a question and Joan. Joao is first, so he should go. Uh, 
it's mostly, I guess, like a question of clarification about how you're interpreting the mm -hmm. results. If you go back to your first set of impulse response functions, um, if you look at the middle column, right, you have included in the regression mm -hmm. uh, both the share of finance and information rents in net income in unproductive activities. So it's mm -hmm. a distribution of net income in unproductive activities between finance and information mm -hmm. versus the rest. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I would imagine government and right like the, these other uh, sectors. And then below in, in panel E, right, you have the share of non, uh, sorry, net income uh, or the ratio of net income. Of it's not a share. Yeah, it's, it's not a share. It's just, it's not a share because you cannot say that unproductive activities are a share of productive. It's, it's a ratio. Right. It's a ratio, you're right. Yeah. yeah, it's just a ratio, it's a ratio, yeah. Uh, but I know it's not a share, but let's, let's say that that tells us something about the distribution of what we traditionally measure as value added in conventional accounting between productive and unproductive activities. Could I say that that's signaling? Uh, so, so yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Which, which effect are you most concerned with or interested in? Are you interested in the distribution between finance and information rents within the unproductive activities for a given split or ratio, right, between unproductive activities and productive activities, or, or the other way around, or wouldn't you be interested in just having one measure as opposed to the two separate in a regression? So you let them very freely, right? You don't you don't freeze one and look at the partial effect of the other. Does that make any sense? <laughs> no, I no no yeah I have been I have been thinking about this, but because if if I control for both, then I can say, you know, overall, unproductive activities have had a positive impact, but within unproductive activities, we can see that it's actually finance and the monopolization of um, you know information and knowledge that that is actually um, the, one of the one of the drivers of inequality and and um, and being a drag in terms of value creation um, I, I know what you mean I just don't see where where the problem is like I mean I could remove e but I mean at the uh, when I say E, I mean the panel E. Mm -hmm. But why? Because you see, B panel B is measuring a share. It's the share of finance information rents within mm -hmm. productive activities. But panel E is measuring the growth, the overall growth of the net income of unproductive activities relative to a value-added production. So I, I need both. I need I need both because. You know, you can grow your share of something that is not growing, but actually you're growing your share into something that is actually growing, right? Relative to, um, and my results show that uh, the, the the overall behavior of you, you cannot confuse finance and information rents on one side and the overall behavior of unproductive activities. I mean, there is something, I'm saying there is something particular about finance and uh, information rents in the United States. That's what I'm... Um, I guess I'll just... I think now Mike Carr is going to ask me about that. Yeah. A quick follow-up question. Well, uh, you are not, wait, you, you are not, you are not like comfortable with the... I was wondering if the, the, two, the two controls, if you could, if it would make sense, for example, uh, to just try to get a measure of these two activities, right, that you're interested in primarily, uh, in the total value added in a conventional sense, right? If we could somehow, uh, you know, okay, sum no, the two components just, of productive, yeah, just, yeah. Okay. the way we do in a non-Marxist way, right? And then look at the share of those two, uh, and see if um, you know. I'll, I'll you know I'll leave it as a question because I think we, we have other questions as well. Yeah, Mike, and then John. 
I think that actually my question is actually kind of similar to Joel's. So I'm having a lot of trouble just thinking through what your regression is actually measuring. Um, because like if you think about, you know, a regression is supposed to set up some counterfactual world, right? Like imagine that I could change this one thing without anything else changing. But the 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 I was about to move my cursor on the screen as if you could see that. Um, the, I think the problem here is that so if you look at panel B and panel E, panel B has NIUA in the denominator, and then panel E has it in the numerator. And, and then panel B and panel C has share of finance and rents in, in the numerator twice, and KUA shows up twice, once in denominator and once in the numerator. And so it's really hard to understand what it means to, to change the share of finance in net income of unproductive activities while holding fixed the share of net income and unproductive activities in value added. I think it's the case that the only way that that can happen is if the share of finance is increasing in the share of value added, right? Because I think that NIUA has to be held fixed in both to, to make our counterfactual work. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can rethink the specification and this will actually make it a lot simpler. In a lot of contexts, when we wanna get a share interpretation, we just control for both variables as variables. So we would have finance and rents and NIUA as controls. And then when you hold NIUA fixed and you increase finance and rents, you're increasing the share in NIUA. Because I think part of what Joao is getting at is that you that these, these X variables overlap with each other in a way that causes the, the counterfactual exercise to sort of break down. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to interpret what a coefficient is actually measuring. And then my my other question is, you said I'm having trouble with endogeneity. Um, you know, the, these ARDL models, right, all they're really doing is saying this thing tends to change before something else. But these are super persistent processes. And so I'm really not sure to what extent um, knowing that that one persistent pro one element of a persistent process tends to change a little bit before another element of a persistent process to the extent that that's establishing causality. I don't know that that matters though, right? Like, I don't know that it matters that this one thing is causing this other thing so much as you have a magnitude that you can say this is the extent to which they tend to move together over time. So I just, I don't know, I would just get rid of the word causal and be happy with it, <laughs> um, but but think harder about the interrelationships among your X variables and what that means for the this sort of counterfactual that your regression is trying to capture. Anyway, that's it. Let me ask you something back. Have you ever seen people doing GMM with time series? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, actually I was gonna say yes, sure, but I'm actually not sure. There, I mean, there, there are any number of time series models that rely on a GMM estimation. So the, the GMM itself, like that doesn't give you causality. It just gives you the ability to have more flexible moment specifications, right? And so in, in some cases that's super useful. Um, for example, if you are working with a theoretical model that has very clear predictions for what the second moment the first and second moments of variables should be, then you can estimate those second moments and not rely on OLS parameterizations, right? Um, but, you know, for, for example, I don't know if there's an Ariano bond equivalent for time series data or, or something that some kind of IV kind of thing that's using lags to predict as opposed to just using the lags. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if that, if that really solves, conceptually solves the problem when you're dealing with these kinds of persistent processes. The Ar Ariano bond in panel data is usually used when we think we have a not persistent process. So with the, um, and I mean, it's, that's not the right word. When we think that persistence is short-lived, 
So lag one matters a lot, but lag two doesn't matter for the for for t. So t minus one matters for t, but t minus two doesn't matter for t, and that's why we can use t minus two to predict t minus one. But if t minus seven matters for t, then we shouldn't be using t minus seven to predict t minus one because t minus one matters for t and t minus seven matters for t, and so t minus seven is a part of t to also, right? And that that's like the logic behind Ariana Bond. So I don't I don't know. If um, I don't think that GMM itself will inherently solve the estimation problem, but it is possible that there is a GMM estimation that specifies the moments differently that allows you to think beyond just saying, well, this tends to, to change before that, some sort of simultaneous equations modeling technique, maybe, or something like that. Something that, that might explicitly acknowledge that all of this stuff is coming out of the same system maybe i don't know no, I, I i completely understand you i'm that's what i'm struggling with not right now it's i mean so your suggestion is to just replace the word causes with predicts yeah or with relationship between you just say just you know okay. I, just like, I want to quantify the contribution of this to that Right, and that's basically what you're just like. When you say, well, what, but when you say contribution, you mean causality, right? I mean, I understand the no, word contribution. No, no, no. So ca causality implies that if I, that I can change this thing and only this one thing and and recreate the counterfactual world, right? So it it implies an if and only if. Y changed because X changed, and the only reason Y changed was because X changed. What I'm saying is, is more in a decomposition sense. That's like, I see that Y increased ah, by, okay. Okay. by 110%. To what extent did the 40% change in this other variable contribute to that 100% change in that, in that Y variable? That's what I mean by contrib contribution. And, and I think what's nice okay. about that is that in some sense, your descriptive analysis is really about, is it has a sort of decomposition-y kind of, logic you have these you have all these parallel cumulative changes and the question is just like how much of this cumulative change wound up in that cumulative change and it's not a causal they're all coming from the same system it's more of a like a decomposition -y kind of logic yeah i see i see yeah no, I mean, I no, I, I understand your, your concerns. It's it's what I have been struggling with. I mean, ultimately, I would like to make a big a causal claim, but at the very aggregate level, using time series, sixty-five yeah. data points. <laughs> I mean, because another another completely different strategy, and I have. And I was going to do that was to say, okay, no, just okay, finish with this time series stuff, and then use uh, panel data sets from the United States. But then, when I use, I don't know what you know, if I do what Leila uh, was doing or or Oz, Oz, uh, Ozgur or Hangazi were doing, like the thing is, I cannot. I try to do that, but I cannot see information rents at the firm level. In the way that the data is compiled, I cannot measure information rents if I use firm level data. I have not, I have talked with other people about this, and Osgur also tried, but he had, he, I don't know if maybe he gave up. Because when you look at like CompuStat and like, oh, you know, that's like, Orbis or you know that's that sort of data set. You have these classifications like intangible assets and so forth, and sometimes they're like a huge component of revenues or 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 costs or or assets, and then you don't know what they measure, like it's a mess. So I'm using input output tables because they give me first a picture of the entire US economy. Um, you know, they have the methodology that has been established. It's, I think it's a serious methodology, not free from defects. But then the problem is this, I have 65 data points, 
time series, I would like to establish causality, but then anybody could say, you know, of course you have endogeneity problems, you know, how can, and I say, okay, so I'm just predicting. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I was thinking about the GMM estimators for time series because I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna instrumentalize using, you know, the lags and, but maybe it's not gonna solve the problem. So yeah, maybe I should just do what you suggest and, and drop the, you know, the causal inference and just say it predicts or contributes. Yeah, I think that's the, the solution. John has a question, but he just put it in the chat. So, um, Tomas, yeah, you I got a, quickly I want got to a round, but I'll follow up. Okay. Uh, Tomas, you quickly want to conclude your slides? We are also reaching the end of yeah. the seminar uh, period. Sure. What time is it, by the way? It's, oh, it's almost 9 p.m. here. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, yeah, so the last slide is about inequality. So here we can see clearly. Uh, so now the dependent variable is the share of the top uh, 1%, uh, the positive contribution from the rate of exploitation. So as expected, if you increase the rate of exploitation, it does increase the share of the top 1%. If the share of finance, information rents, uh, if it rises, it also contributes to the um, to increase inequality. Um, yeah, the same for the top 0.1%. Um, so now the final remarks. Now I promise that's the very last slide. Um, so um, Marxist theory has a theory of value and a consistent approach to productive and unproductive activities that I believe that Keynesian and Kaletskin theories do not have. We can argue if that's uh, uh, relevant or not. I believe it is relevant. I, be, I, be, I might be mistaken, but I still believe it's relevant. Um, and what I'm claiming is the Marxist theory of value can be expanded to the growing domain of commodified knowledge and information. That's what I have been trying to do. Uh, the, the recent literature, especially the heterodox literature, has been mostly focused on finance and financial assets in the determination of growth and distribution. All that I'm trying to claim is uh, knowledge rents should be given at least equal importance in the determination of growth and distribution. That's all that I'm trying to, to claim. Um, so as a summary of the results, knowledge rents in the US, they have, uh, well, predicted <laughs> increases in labor productivity, uh, but at the price of reducing value added growth and also increasing economic uh, inequality. And that's it. That's it, what I, sorry for taking so much time, <laughs> but uh, it's a kind of long paper. Oh, no worries, no worries. Um, thanks so much to Mas for a very interesting talk. I'm sure that uh, when the board of editors of the Cambridge Journal of Economics uh, will go to the end of your slides, there will be some very fertile discussion amongst them and probably will be quite violent too. Um, okay, um, so uh, I guess that concludes, uh, that concludes the seminar portion.